Amen. Amen. Everybody happy? Yes. You must be trying to be holy then. Praise the Lord. It's good to be back in the pulpit this Sunday. I've missed you guys last couple Sundays. I feel completely backslidden. I always know we leave you in capable hands with Pastor Strickland. Hope he didn't abuse you. You know, if he doesn't preach for a few months, he just really comes unwound in the pulpit after a while. So he really loves you, okay? Whatever he said, I'll just touch you know he does love you. Amen, Tim? So, <laughs> just got to get it said every once in a while. Tim didn't use that as the song before he preached last week. Finding myself at a loss for words, did you, Tim? That wasn't you? <laughs> Nor will I find it as my theme song today either. But it is good to see you today. Just a quick update. Hopefully we'll have Kathy back in church next Sunday. Uh, hallelujah. Appreciate your prayers, your support, your, your, your blessings have just been overwhelming and overflowing in our hearts and lives. We can't thank you enough for your attentive care, meals, all that you've done. You're, you've been such a blessing to us and we can't say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you enough. You've been a blessing to us and no way we'll ever be able to repay that. Just, just, you're just you know, great to be a member of Believer's Fellowship where people love God and love each other. Thank you for, for being there. It's been, a, it's been a journey. Praise the Lord. I've asked her then we get back and maybe not next Sunday, but now she's doing it on Sunday after that to take some time and share a testimony of this journey uh, to, to know that God has been up to a lot of different things. We did get to see our cardiologist the first, uh, uh, the first week. Who, in fact, he, well, it was Friday, one of the first weeks, last week. I, I, my days are gone. I've messed up, all right? So <laughs> they'll be back sometime in the near future, hopefully. But uh, he was almost giddy with excitement. He just, you know, was... He's overdoing, looking everything that the surgeon had done and all the procedures that had been taken care of and how well she was doing and the progress that she'd been making. And, you know, I think he was more excited than she was about it. But he uh, said, we're going to get you, uh, he said, he said, phenomenal that you've come so fast, so, so, so quickly in your, in your recovery and that, uh, you know, you're doing all the things you're able to do already. I said, well, that's the power of prayer. And God answers prayer. And we have a lot of people praying for everybody involved. So they said, our next goal is over the next 60 to 90 days to get you off every medication that you've had to take for the last three years. So all that stuff be a thing of the past. So keep praying and believing, amen? God, God answers prayer. I didn't tell you about the man who had a heart attack and he was rushed to the hospital himself and very touch and go and they, everybody around him was told, you know, don't do anything to arouse uh, any excitement or anticipation or worries. Just, you know, nothing emotionally is going to this guy and you keep him at a steady, eddy for a while, you know, just don't do anything that would just get him excited. We just need to keep his heart rate and blood pressure and everything just calm as possible. Uh, word came to one of his relatives that uh, a rich uncle of this man who's in the hospital, a rich uncle had passed away and the man was going to receive an inheritance of millions of dollars. And they said, we can't tell him that, you know, no telling what will happen this, you know, sensitive condition that he's in. What, what possibly could it result be? So, uh, so they called on the pastor. I don't know if because he was so boring or what and said, we would like you to break the news to him about this inheritance, but do it in a way that, you know, that won't get him. So the pastor thinks he comes up with a great plan. He walks in there and he says, you know, knowing how sensitive it is and how things could cause a heart attack. And he says, sir, you know, he said, it's good to see you. He did a little visitation thing. He said, by the way, if you, if you, if you inherited millions of dollars, what would you do with it? He said, well, man, I'd give half of it to the church. At which point the preacher dropped dead. So anyway... <laughs> Speaking of money, two weeks ago, I we've got three now, I shared with you that message uh, on one of, of the two series of messages that on, on giving, and we talked with the sermon title series was called Give Up, and the idea is that we're giving up to the Lord, and that's the direction that most of our giving needs to go. We talked about how some people don't give up, they, they won't give up to the Lord. We talked about the Macedonians, when Paul said, you know, when I went to the Macedonians and I shared them about the needs for the saints in Jerusalem and how terrible shape they were in and how they were suffering, how that the Macedonians, man, they stepped right up. And he said, you know, they gave this great bountiful offering and they're poor people. That was the context of that message. And he says, he said, but first they gave themselves to the Lord. That's where our giving starts. We, we always start with an upward motion of giving ourselves to the Lord and everything can fall and follow with that. We talked about the Macedonian method that they had, that they followed the procedure, the principles that they followed in their life in their giving and in, in, in the stewardship of life. And Paul's continuing his, 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 the, the, the theme of that, that stewardship and the theme of learning to be a giver and learning how to, to give offerings to the Lord. With this message today, we talk about giving, give up. And I want to talk about more about motivations because I think so often 
uh, we don't understand the motivations for our giving. So I want to talk about, about that. But let's, let's look at what he continues to say after he speaks to the Corinthians about the Macedonians. He goes on to say, I say, he who sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart. Catch this. In your heart's where it starts. Not grudgingly, not under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that you'll always have all sufficiency in everything. In other words, God's going to meet all your needs. But you can also have an abundance for every good deed. In other words, you have enough left to give to others. It is written, he scattered abroad, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now, he who supplies, that's the Lord, seed to the sower, bread for food, the Lord will supply and multiply your seed for sowing. In other words, so you can give more and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in everything for all liberality, for which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. I want to just look at this verse here and see what, uh, what it means to have the right and the proper motivations and how we respond when it comes to giving. A lot of people don't like to hear sermons about giving because most of the time that's because they, they don't like to give. But I want to talk to you about five levels, I believe, of motivation for giving and talk about the strengths and the weaknesses. Now, first of all, it, I'm, I'm gonna, motivation number one is important, but you have to get to motivation number one. A lot of people never get to motivation number one. Motivation number one is in our giving is we give, uh, you know, because we, we feel like we, we have to give. It's, it's almost like a guilt motivation that we're driven by. Well, I, sh I, ought to, I, I have to give, so I, I'm going to give. That's not what Paul was talking about when he says giving is your purpose in your heart and giving and is a cheerful giver. That doesn't fit into that, that, that mode there. Some people haven't gotten here yet, though. They don't want to give. They don't feel they need to give. They don't feel they ought to give. They don't enjoy giving. So we're talking about if, if that's you, well, this is not going to help you much today. <laughs> All right? If you're a stingy old crotchety whatever, enjoy your rotten little life. Oh, come on, get over it. <laughs> because life is rotten if you haven't learned how to be a giver, folks. Let me just put it clearly. Life and the abundance of life comes from giving. And true giving is it's where found, you find true living. So if you want to be alive and living, learn how to be a person that's giving. You'll see what God does as a result of that and, and equal to that. So the idea here is, though, you get to number one, and this is that I should do it. Now, a lot of Christians, when people come to the Lord at first, and they start understanding the context of what stewardship is. That's a good Bible word, which means management. They begin to realize that God holds us accountable for management of our lives, management of our time, management of our talents, management of our treasures. God, God's put me in charge. He's the boss. I'm just the manager. You got that? He's, he's the boss, right? And I manage, and my management should be what would be pleasing to my boss, the Lord God himself. But sometimes when people come to the Lord and they start realizing you know, this part about giving, sometimes there's that mindset, well, you know, if that's what I should do, then that's what I'll do. I've seen that demonstrated. We do a 201 class where we talk about uh, this on, on, and about five other issues in our 201 class where we talk about d discipleship and growing in Christ and how that there really needs to be some dedicated, decisive actions on your part if you're going to be a mature believer. There's some disciplines. There's, you need to have a time in the Word of God. You need to have a disciplined commitment to study the Bible, a disciplined commitment that you'll pray, spend time with God, Christianity's fellowship that you'll get involved with other believers and be involved in, in, in ministry and in fellowship and church and in, 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 in small groups and Bibles. So you'll be involved. And then we talk about this, this element about learning how to participate on the level of your finances. That God holds us accountable for what he's blessed us with and we should honor him with our substance. And we talk about that and people go through the 201 class and they kind of get the end of it and they go, well, okay, I'll give, I guess I ought to, you know, I, I, and this amount of it. if I don't do it, then I'm gonna feel guilty. That's not the mindset behind the idea when Paul wrote the church about being hilarious givers. People who would show, and that word hilarious, cheerful, that's the same word. The Greek word is hilaros. It's the idea that we're excited. We're, we're, we're giddy when it comes to giving. We just like, it's exciting to give. Now you say, what makes it so exciting? Well, that's the process of what this is all about. We'll, we'll explain it as we go down. But with each one of these motivations, I want to show you that there is a strength and there's a weakness. Now, the only strength, you know, of, of this, instead of being a cheerful giver, of feeling having to give, is that, you know, guilt can be an effective tool for bringing in more money. And some preachers will use guilt 
to get people to give more money. And, and that's pretty much a lot of the charitable giving in the world is built upon that kind of, you have been blessed and you've got so much and look, they have nothing, you know, and they, since they don't have anything and you have something, it's kind of like shame on you if you don't do something. You've all seen those ads and stuff, right? No? Anyway, there's, a, there's an element of guilt in that. There's that element of, that kind of twitches you and your conscience and yeah, maybe, maybe, well, I, well, I, I, well, I have to give. Now, that, that's not really even a, a good strength. The, it may produce some outcomes, but I never in this church preach in the context of stewardship to make people feel guilty. We, we're not under the bondage of the law. We want people to experience freedoms. We want people to experience the victory that comes from being an obedient child of God. And so if you're stopping here, then there's not much to it. The, the, it's a bad motivation. The weakness of this is basically that it's unbiblical. It brings no joy. It doesn't help you outgrow materialism. It doesn't help you walk in, in, on a deeper level with the Lord. And remember this, when it comes to our relationship with God, attitude always matters. Attitude is always important. So how I give and the attitude that I serve the Lord with, the attitude that I work with other believers, that, that's extremely important. Learning how to get past the guilt to be the cheerful giver. Some of you remind me of the little girl who, who, whose mother wanted to kind of see where she was spiritually. A little six-year-old girl. And so she gave her a dollar bill and a quarter. She says, I want you to put an offering in the church today. You decide which one you're going to give. And so she went to church and it was time for the offering. And the preacher gave this little stirring thing about, hey, I remember folks, it's more joyful to give than it is to receive. And, you know, all the things and the plates were passed. And she gave her offering. On the way out, Mama said, Honey, did you give the dollar or the quarter? So, Mama, I really took to heart what the preacher said. This, that I could be more joyful if I kept the dollar than gave, and, and I gave the quarter. <laughs> that's where some people, well, I'll be happy if I keep the larger amount. And they get in that, well, it's all, it's all guilt driven. Catch the next motivation. This is motivation number two of five. It's called responsibility. That kind of mindset where I move from have to to, well, well ought to. In fact, Paul wrote the church in 2 Corinthians 8, 7. He says, you need to excel in the grace of giving. He said, excel in your faith. You need to excel in your, in your, in your speech and your witness. And you need to excel in your liberality, your giving. He said, that doesn't need to be something you lack in. It's something to the Corinthians he was saying, you don't need to be stingy. You know, you really ought to learn how to give. You really ought to learn how to be a part of what God's doing. And it, it implies a, a level of responsibility that you and I have to give to the Lord. Now, most people still haven't got that far. I remember reading a recent study on congregational giving that said about 20% of the members of the church give about 80% of the funds that are required to run the church. Kind of broke it down to 30% give 20% of it. Approximately 50% of the average church, and I, don't, I think we fall outside those parameters. I've always thought we were exceptional, amen. But 50% of the average church members never give anything at all, ever. Now folks, I was gonna tell you, if you're a child of God, you ought to be giving. That's not the motivation, but it ought to certainly be some kind of discipline in your life where you move to the point of saying, hey, I wanna be a part of something. Now the strength and weakness with this, the strength is this, money, when it's given for ministry, you know, you approach it that way, it's a better motivation than giving out of guilt. People learn responsibility and responsibility is always a healthy character trait, amen? But we wanna teach people the responsibility that we all have in the kingdom of God. God's called us the body, every part has a gift, every part's supposed to be supplying, every part is supposed to be giving, every part is supposed to be doing and serving and working. So we teach a little bit of responsibility, but the weakness, when that's the motivation, giving solely out of responsibility will limit the joy that God wants you to experience in your life when it comes to giving. And I believe also, limits the, the amount that I give when I give. If I just give strictly out of some kind of a legalistic approach, well, I ought to give, you know, the pastor talked about a percentage and 10% and tithing and all that. It's easy to say, okay, I gave my amount, I did my part, I'm done. I'll make it. <laughs> I'll give by. That's not the motivation that I believe that the Lord is, that the Lord is pleased with in our life. So there's the strength of it, which, you know, you learn some responsibility. But this, there's another motivation where a lot of people fall into, and it's what I call motivation number three, called want to giving. 
needs-based giving. A lot of people are driven by the, in their giving by needs. They see a need, they respond to a need. Something moves their heart, something they see, and they respond to it financially. And, you know, God wants us to be concerned, obviously, about meeting needs. Remember when Paul is talking to the Corinthians in this letter, he's pointing out a need. He's talking about the Jerusalem needs and the church's needs in Jerusalem and how they were suffering. And because of all the persecution, how many were dying, how the, you know, the, the church needed to respond to their brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, and I, I believe if he'd had a PowerPoint to show him pictures, he probably would have. <laughs> but I think he gave them a very clear, accurate picture of need. And their hearts were moved by the need. The Macedonians were moved by need. But we'll see later on that it went beyond need because they said they first gave themselves to the Lord. So there's an illustration here of the importance of letting the church know when there are needs and financial concerns and opportunities to give something. But knowing about a need often kindles a desire for, for me to say, hey, I want to be a part of providing resources. If I was ever in that situation, I think I would want God's people to do something to help meet that need in my life. So we, we see there's, there's some kind of basis, but there are strengths and weaknesses. It's the strength is this. Giving to satisfy needs does feel good, all right? That kind of giving does bring a cheerful heart on some level. And it, it, it doesn't rely on compulsion or guilt to motivate people to do something to meet that need. It touches the heartstrings. It encourages people to learn a discipline of giving and sometimes to be pulled on so much by the present need as to say, hey, I want to do something even sacrificial. I want to be involved in that. And there's a lot of things that are presented, especially in the church day, that are needs. Now, I've always tried to, to tell people need doesn't always represent a call. So when you do see a need, make sure that's the Lord telling you to respond to that need because there's a lot of things that can pull our heartstrings, amen? There's a lot of things that can, so we just want to be involved with what God's will is. Giving according to a need is what a lot of churches use to raise large sums of money even. And to get people involved in giving, perhaps you might never get involved in giving. And there are needs that come up. I mean, we, we had a tremendous need here, close to $100,000 with all the air conditioner systems and all that was going on there. And the people responded graciously to the need. I think by the end of December, all those things were paid for. Now we have two more units this year we're gonna supply, but that's another need. We'll talk about it another time when the time is right. But people do respond to need. But that's really not, even though it's more positive than the others, it's not the motivation that we should have. There's two more things I, I want to talk to you about here in, in these motivations. I think that'll help you that. But the weakness with this one is some people don't approve or see needs. You know, some people are just negative about those things and, and they ignore requests. Even though there might be a legitimate need, they're not moved by that need. I mean, we all see that happen all the time. There's some things that move you and some things that don't move you and to give to something. And, you know, it's just that, you know, it's, but if it, it can't be just need driven. The church has ongoing efforts, which may not tug my heartstrings, but it's a need, all right? So we want to pray and we want to move forward and say, my giving can't just be based upon needs. And sometimes I'm giving because there's a need, but that can't be the, the real genuine motivation. The fourth one is this. I just call it Thanksgiving. You get that point where you, ex you have to express gratitude, you know? And there's this, you're motivated at that point because something's been done. You, 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 all of a sudden you see the need, it, it seems to, to express your, your, your heart to someone because they've done something before you or you've experienced some blessing from others. And you say, hey, you know, I, I, just, I, I just want to, I got I to gotta respond to that some way. You ever been in that situation? Uh, you know, we were at the, at the hospital after Kathy's surgery. You know, that was probably the most exhausting thing I've been through those, those two weeks. You know, because you're, you're staying at the hospital, it's terrible accommodations, the food stinks, you know. Uh, they, you know, you go down and they have the, the little restaurants down below and they all look really good, but it's all just fast food junk, you know, off a frozen truck somewhere. And it's, it's not really good. And they, they, they let you stay in the hospital in the room and they put you on, they have a chair in the room, it's about this wide and it pulls out and makes it, y'all stayed on someone's floor, right? They stayed extended, stayed in the hospital, you know. And about two nights of that is like torture. Five nights is like, you know, purgatory. Seven nights is hell. You know, you've arrived, you know, the destination finally. You're hurting, you're sore, you're not sleeping because after heart surgery, open heart surgery, they come in every hour on the hour turn the big lights up, bang on the door. You awake? Yeah. Uh, always. <laughs> Here, they come in, they want to take the blood pressure, they want to check all the vitals, they want to give medicine, they want to do this, they want you to set, not me, but I'm, you know, it's, it's all going on. So 
that's going on. And you're sitting there because, you know, they've just, you know, cracked your wife right open. So you're listening for every breath all night long to make sure. Remember y'all taking a new baby, born baby, your first baby home? How many of y'all remember that? And every five minutes you go into the, into the, to the nursery there at the house where the baby bed is, you see if they're still breathing. You know, houses, this, this is incredible. How, they can't still be breathing, can they? So you're always checking. So it's just, you know, it, it's exhausting. I got where I kind of lost my mind after, after two days of ICU and then about four more days of in the hospital stuff. You know, I, I didn't know if I was coming or going. I didn't know if it was Monday or Sunday, if it was the 4th or the 15th, the 31st. You know, I'm just kind of wandering around aimlessly like a homeless person at the hospital. I remember going to, I told Kathy, I'm going to get something out of the car that I left in the car. So I go up to get the car parking lot and I get to, and I can't find the car. I'm on the wrong floor. You know, so I, I, I got real smart the first day that I was there and started taking pictures of the columns that I parked by. So I get my phone out. Was that yesterday? That was the day before. Where did I park yesterday? Well, I was over here. You know, and you're going through all that. And you're, so I found it, my, my place to park. Finally, I got kind of sick of the food. I told Kathy, I said, listen, there's, there's a subway, there's a Chipotle across the street or something. I'm just going to get something over there to eat. And she said, I said, I'll be right back. So I walked out of the hospital, walked across the street and, and <clears throat> ordered a burrito at Chipotle's against all the warnings of the media and everything. I was ready to call it a day. <laughs> Lay me in the bed beside her. I'm done. So I ordered this burrito and I'm standing there and I'm standing there. And this lady finally, she hands me my cup to get a drink. And I'm stand, I paid for everything. And I'm still standing there and I'm standing there and I'm standing there. And I said, ma'am, where's my burrito? She said, sir, it's, it's in your hand. Thank you very much. <laughs> You've been there, those moments of exhaustion. The next morning, I go down for breakfast to go down to the lovely restaurants they have down there. And I go down to the restaurant, and uh, everybody's, you know, it's that time of shift change. Everybody's in line, so I'm getting my food, and I'm patiently standing in line, you know, getting a little bit farther, a little bit farther. I finally get to the front, lay my tray down. She says, that'll be $7.99. I reach in to get my wallet. Wallet. Yeah, check that pocket. You know, it's kind of like the Macarena. <laughs> God, nothing to show, nothing to give for it. And I'm almost in tears at this point. So I said, oh, man, I'm so sorry. I said, uh, I don't know where my head is. I said, I, I, I don't have any money. I said, can I just leave this tray here and I'm go? I know, my, I know my wallet. It's in my car. I got it in, in the lock in, in the, in the, in the, in the bag in my trunk. I said, let me go get my wallet. I come back. No, so you can't do that. You can't just leave your tray here. She said, let me buy you breakfast. I said, no, you can't buy me breakfast. She said, let me buy you breakfast. Don't worry about it. So I'm, you know, I just believe that somebody's, if I buy breakfast for you, somebody's going to buy breakfast for me when I need it. You know, she, she understood the law of the harvest. Amen. And I'm about ready to cry. It, it's this moment when it was thankful. I can't help it. I sat down, ate my breakfast as quick as I could. Went and got my wallet out of the car and got a $100 bill. And I went back and I, she said, oh, you don't have to pay me, sir. I said, here, I want you to take this and just be, be a blessing. I said, you don't know how much a blessing in that moment you were to me in my delirium and my fatigue. I said, I just, I, I, need, I need to do something for you. No, I don't. So I give it to you. Well, let me give you a change. I don't want any change. Just buy somebody else breakfast. You know what I said? But I just want you to know you were a blessing. You were a gift from God today. And I feel like I need to. I can't help but do something here. That's, the, that's, that's good giving, all right? That, that's giving out of thanksgiving. That's, there's something that just motivates us. It, and it's a way that we express, you know, thanks to a person and, 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 and praise to God. You know, and bless her heart, that probably would buy her a few breakfasts as well. Amen. She's working on a little minimum wage cashier line. But there's strengths to that kind of giving, but there's also witness, weaknesses to that kind of giving. The strength is this. When you give out of Thanksgiving, it feels good, you know. It felt good. She started to get all teary-eyed. She's feeling good. And, you know, and then she starts testifying to the next lady in line what just happened. You know, I just bought that man breakfast. He came back here and gave me it. So, you know, it, that, there's that moment we all feel good. We get those kind of gifts. We know we're genuinely uh, 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 out of an expression of our heart. And it points our hearts in the right, it, our, the right direction. It, it moves us to the right place. It, it's an unselfish giving that encourages, you know, uh, us to to do something beyond ourselves to be a blessing to somebody else. There is a weakness to that kind of giving. The weakness is this. There's nothing wrong with that motivation for giving, but it's limited by our perception of thankfulness. Let me say that again. It's limited by our perception of thankfulness. If we are not aware of the blessings, if we're not paying attention, if we don't realize our neediness, which we don't most of the time, then we're not very appreciative. All right? This last several weeks, this last three and a half years, specifically the last six months, I have been more appreciative of my wife than any other time for all the things that she used to do around the house. 
and soon we'll be able to do again. <laughs> I said, there's only two people here. Where's this laundry coming from? There's only two people in this house. How can there be this much junk going on? How can we accumulate this many dirty dishes? And I didn't bring this stuff here on the floor. <laughs> Where did all this dirt come from? You know, you, you develop an appreciation, but what, what about all those times when I'm not having to do it? I didn't appreciate it. So husband, you reach over to your wife and say, man, I love you. <laughs> Take a little moment because that's the problem with this. If we're just giving out of Thanksgiving, we're not always perceptive to what's going on. And obviously we, we aren't always perceptive as to what God's doing and how God is moving. Well, I think we'll have our minds completely blown one day when we stand at the throne of God and we see all the grace, all the deliverance, all the, all the salvation moments of our life that God spared us in something or delivered us in something or helped us through something that we just really didn't see it before. And our eyes get open to the eternal spiritual things. It's, it's gonna be a, a mind blowing moment. But unfortunately, in our life, if this is our only basis of our giving, is we just feel like something's been done for us, we're going to miss the joy how God, you know, uh, how God is moving in our life. And, you know, and most times because we're just not paying attention. So realize there's a joy here. But you say, well, then, if, <clears throat> then what is the real motivation in my giving? As a, as a child of God, what is the biblical place that I should come to? Well, I, I think it's this. It's, it's a place of worship where it becomes my nature. I love God. I realize that God is the author of all things. I realize that God is the one who has made me and created me and blessed me the way that he's blessed me. I realize that if I have anything, I owe it all to him. I realize that he's my father. He's delivered me and saved me. He's delivered me from the, not only the bondage of, of, of sin in my life and the, 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 the bondage of future punishment of hell in my life, but he's, he's, he's moved me and set me on a firm place. He's become my rock. He's my refuge. He's my strong and mighty tower. He enables me. He strengthens me. And I begin to grow into a place of spirituality and maturity in my life to realize, hey, this whole thing's about the Lord ultimately. I love that passage when Paul's talking to the Corinthians. He said, let me tell you about the Macedonians. They first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us. You know, in other words, they responded to the needs. They responded to the call to give. They responded to the offering because they first gave themselves to the Lord. And then they responded on another level. They gave themselves, first of all, to Jesus. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, when Paul's using the Macedonians as an example, he's pointing out the greatest unique quality of our giving. Is that it? It all is about Jesus. It's all about the Lord. It's all about the glory of God. It's all about the kingdom of God. It's all about seeing God's will done. It's all about God moving in our lives, moving in the world. And my financial decisions as regarding my giving should ultimately flow out of my relationship with the Lord and how I'm walking with him, how I'm standing with him. And I believe many times as Jesus talked on stewardship, he was probably pointing at the fact that the depth of my stewardship, my commitment to the kingdom is pretty much manifested by my depth of my relationship to my father. That I, I, if I really do love God, I end up putting my money where my, my, where my mouth is, amen? Because it flows from the heart. When it's your nature, when you're walking in the spirit, when you're being sensitive to God, when you're growing in Christ, it's your nature to give to God because it becomes now, it's an act of worship. How often have we told people as they come and as they go, coming in with their offerings or leaving with their offerings, the reason we, don't, we have the receptacles and not past places is because people, we want you to realize that this is an act of worship. Look at the Old Testament, look at the New Testament. When people came to the temple or to, this, to the tabernacle, they were offering receptacles that they would place their gifts in as they came to worship. When Jesus was standing at the, tab, at the temple one day, it says he stood over and against the treasury. What is that? Those were those boxes boxes that were there for people to place their gifts in. Remember the widow came through and he said, she cast in more than all. What was he talking about? What she cast into? There's, there were these places. They were just a, a symbolic place of it where we would worship the Lord and say, here, here's what I want to do for the glory of God. Here's my confession of the gospel. Here's my act of trust to the Lord. Here's what I need to do for the Lord. So we, we are a little different than not passing the plates. In fact, I never could stand that time in church. You know, it was always the most somber, horrible organ music. It felt like you were at a funeral procession. People are always so sad. Nothing to do with cheerful giving. 
plates go by and they just look like, I don't know, somebody died and laid the carcass in there. I'm not sure. But it, it, you know, it's just, you know, and they pretend to put something in or crumple up something or wad it up so smart you got 14,000 little pieces, you know. Poor guy has to count the offering that day. <laughs> It is an act of giving unto the Lord. And not somebody standing over your shoulder watching you're going to give something, you're not going to give something. But you just worshiping God. Now, you say, what is, what is the real strength of that motivation? Well, the strength is, you know, there's only strength, basically. It's worship is the highest possible motivation that we can have. It creates in our heart when we desire to be worshiped, it creates commitment. It, cre it creates a, a fellowship. It, it shows a demonstration we truly love God, that we want his work to be done in people's lives. We want his kingdom to advance. We want the church to grow. We want, we, got, we want souls to be saved. And guess what? That feels good when you think about it. And that creates an attitude of cheerfulness where I can come in and say, I want to do something for the glory of God. It's my worship. Kathy was begging me about coming to church today. I wouldn't let her. Doctor said, stay out one more week. He said, because you know that incision and the coughing issue, if you pick up something like bronchitis or a cold, right now, it's not gonna be pretty. Wait one more week. And he was right, I know you guys are, you know, dribbling and sniffing and snorting, you're gonna come up and hug her and kiss her and all that stuff, you know how you are. <laughs> he said, so wait one more, but you know what her words were, what, what, what some of her last words were this morning to me? She handed me an envelope and said, do not forget to put our offering in the box. Some of you will sit home and snivel with a cold and put in your dollar by some other means. <laughs> it's joy. It's worship. You say, well, what are the weaknesses? There aren't any. <laughs> when it's given with this kind of motivation, motivation, the devil can't steal it. He can't steal your joy. He can't, he can't stop the work of God. He can't hinder the cause of the gospel. He can't keep you from experiencing the blessing. He can't stop you from receiving the reward of your gifts because when you do reap, you do, you know, when you sow, you do reap. So there's just no, there's no negatives here. And as you start realizing that, hey, you know, I need to make always sure that my giving is an act of worship. That when I do it, in fact, some of you have learned the lesson. Some of you have learned it well. I mean, when you give your gifts and you place your offerings, I mean, you put scripture verses. Sometimes it's Luke 6, 38. Sometimes it's Malachi chapter three about Satan, you know, not being able to destroy you and God opened up the window. You, you know, you understand it as an act of worship. You do it as an act of faith. You give it in faith. I'm, this is for the Lord and for the God and for the glory of God and for the work of God, for the kingdom of God. Philippians 4. Paul is thanking the church of Philippi for what they've done. He says, you know, he said, I've received everything in full and I have an abundance. I am amply supplied. Why? He said, because, you know, they sent this gift by Aphrodite. He said, I've received and for what you sent. What did they send? They sent a gift, a financial gift to meet the needs for the ministry that was going on. He said, it, it was like a, it is a, he said, not like, he said, it is a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well pleasing to God. I hope that when we place our gifts before the Lord as an act of worship, we understand that, that it, it is like an offering it, to the Lord. I mean, we see all these offerings in the Old Testament. This is a New Testament offering. This represents a portion of the blessings that he's given me. And so since I recognize that it came from him, I honor him this way in worshiping them this way. And I yield it up to him. And it is a sweet smelling aroma. Smell like dirty money to you. Since it's an act of worship, it's converted to a sweet smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well pleasing to God. What's so well pleasing? Man? It's done with a heart of worship. It's done with a heart of worship. Pearl Bartel wrote this statement. It says, if I fail or succeed in my stewardship of life, he said, I fail to succeed in my stewardship of life in proportion to how convinced I am that life belongs to God. I'm going to fail or succeed in whatever I'm doing, ultimately within my giving, obviously, do I really believe that my life belongs to God? People who don't give their time or their talents or their treasures are not truly convinced that their life does come from God and belong to God. But when we begin to realize that our life comes from God, belongs to God, it's going to God, all things are of Him, through Him, and to Him. We understand that. We get a grip on that concept. Guess what? There's no problem. There's no problem to give and to be a part of what God's doing. 
I think I said a couple weeks ago, stewardship's not leaving a tip on God's tablecloth. It's not my offerings, like some little tip to the waiter. My giving, your giving, our giving becomes a confession of, of our gratitude and our love and our worship for the grace of God that was demonstrated for us and played out for us at Golgotha, Skull Hill, when Jesus shed his very life's blood for us. He gave it all. He gave it all. I remember back in the 80s, there was a little comment that said, you know, the most, the most two expensive words ever spoken were spent by, a, by, a, by an actor, uh, Lee Marvin, I think it was, one of those guys. And he did an advertisement for Schlitz beer. I don't know if they make Schlitz beer anymore, do they? Don't confess, nobody wants to know if you know. Anyway, <laughs> we're in church. But it, the only two words, they paid him, they paid him a half a million dollars for two words in, in, in this ad. And two words were Schlitz light. He got $250,000 a word. Now I'm sure there's probably been more expensive words, but that was the Guinness World Book of Record for saying, Slits light. Take me half a million dollars. I said it twice now, I'll get a million. <laughs> Most expensive words ever spoken were on the cross. God, Jesus says, Father, forgive them. And he said, it's finished. And so we move and we breathe and we live and we act out our lives as an expression of gratitude to God. And we love God and we love each other and we love a lost world. And it's demonstrated that we truly worship God because our motivation is righteous. So examine, because we've all given out of those five probably at different times. But I would say weekly, when you come or bi-weekly as you get paid, however you do that, you know, as you give, always make it an act of joy. Always make it an act of worship. Always with the realization that, that it becomes a, a well-pleasing sacrifice, that it is sweet aroma to God, that God's going to use it for the kingdom, that people's lives are going to be changed, that things are going to be done in eternal sense for the glory of God. Realize the value of it. Realize the beauty of it. Realize the glory of it. Realize Jesus in all of it. Would you stand with your heads bowed this morning?